Next, you'll be hearing about the positive economic impact that carbon capture and sequestration technologies could bring to the state of North Dakota and other regions of the country. Our speaker is Josh Stanislawski, a principal process engineer in energy systems development at the EERC, where his work involves gasification and CO2 capture technologies. He holds a Master of Science and Bachelor of Science degrees in chemical engineering from the University of North Dakota. Mr. Stanilowski's principal areas of interest and expertise include coal and biomass gasification systems with an emphasis on novel syngas cooling, cleanup, and separation technologies. He has worked extensively with hydrogen separation membrane systems and liquid fuels catalysis. He is proficient in process modeling and systems engineering, including techno-economic studies using Aspen Plus software. He has significant experience with process engineering, process controls, and project management. And I'm not sure, maybe he can forecast the weather with all of that. All right, please help me welcome Josh. Thank you, Kevin. I uh, certainly appreciate the warm introduction. Um, I'm from Grand Forks, so historically speaking, I've been a John Wheeler kind of guy. But uh, I think, Kevin, you're starting to win me over a little bit, so appreciate that. Um, I want to talk to you today about a study that we've been doing um, at the Energy and Environmental Research Center. Uh, I think uh, Senator Heidkamp kind of teed it up for us uh, very nicely here earlier uh, in talking about some of the studies that are ongoing at EERC. Uh, what we want to talk about today is a what-if scenario of if we did implement carbon capture, uh, utilization, and storage uh, in the state of North Dakota, what would be the positive uh, economic impact that we, that we might see in the state? So I'd certainly like to thank my co-authors at uh, the EERC, um, as well as uh, Dean Bangson from North Dakota State University. Uh, I'm not an economist, but uh, Dean was instrumental in helping us put together uh, some of the economics uh, for this study and helping us to understand things like job creation. Um, I got to say it is very nice uh, being here in my home state of North Dakota. I think most of you are familiar with the Energy and Environmental Research Center. Uh, typically when I go around the country presenting at uh, conferences, there's a lot of international attendees as well, so I have to you know, kind of point out where the state of North Dakota is to a lot of these attendees. But uh, I think all of you are, are mostly familiar with EERC and the work that we do, and uh, certainly are familiar with the uh, location of our state in the, in the US, so um, another positive. Uh, when we're talking about the regional impacts then of, of carbon capture, uh, utilization, and, and storage, uh, really what we're looking at here is a study that, that's kind of focused on a what-if scenario, saying, you know, if, if our largest plants in the state were to capture carbon, um, and then we were to then use that uh, carbon uh, in the oil wells in the state, as well as for uh, potential for geological sequestration, which I think the 45Q uh, tax credits enable us to do now, uh, what do we see as, as the uh, uh, positive effects as a result of this? And so we're, we're not trying to state whether or not you know it, it's an economic balance right for each of these individual utilities to determine whether or not they want to do carbon capture in the state but what we're trying to say is if we did um, if we moved forward and if we uh, added this to a lot of the units in the state you know what would that positive impact be uh, we know that the lignite industry supports about 14,000 jobs uh, currently in the state um, and that if we did have this CO2 available we could boost the production out of our existing uh, conventional assets um, and so, uh, looking at this scenario, then we are trying to, you know, evaluate a wide-scale implementation um, and what that might mean for the state of North Dakota. Um, I put this slide in here, but I think Senator Heidkamp uh, stole my thunder uh, quite a bit on this one, but she did enumerate pretty well the uh, August 3rd ruling from the, the EPA uh, talking about the Clean Power Plan and the final rule. Uh, we do know that that was a significant challenge, uh, probably unfair to the state of North Dakota, uh, what the proposed rule looked like versus uh, how the final rule was implemented. Uh, we see ourselves in a much better uh, position now uh, with the affordable clean energy rule. Uh, but we also see North Dakota as an opportunity state. Uh, also, as the senator mentioned, you know, we've been doing carbon capture um, out at, uh, you know, Dakota Gas for, for a number of years now and, and selling that CO2 for, for EOR. Um, and so I think we're in a unique position uh, compared to a lot of uh, states uh, around the country to be able to uh, 
uh, take and do this because we think it makes economic sense to do so. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit, but definitely want to focus on you know what we see as as the overall regional impacts going going into a project such as these. Just wanted to touch briefly on a, a little bit of an overview of CCUS studies at the EERC. I know we're working in a lot of different areas, and uh, you know both senators mentioned a couple of the different projects that that we've been working on um, over the last uh, you know few years. Um, and so Project Tundra is, of course, uh, something that I think a lot of people have heard of and are familiar with. Um, you know, exactly what is Project Tundra? Well, it's, it's, it's really a compilation of a lot of the different efforts that we're working on at EERC uh, with the end goal there culminating in us putting together or building in the state of North Dakota a, a post-combustion carbon capture unit uh, you know, at one of our coal-fired facilities. At, at this time, we're looking at Milton, our young unit too, as, as a great candidate for, for that technology. But uh, we've got Project Carbon contained within Project Tundra. We've also got Carbon Safe uh, contained within Project Tundra. So these are both uh, projects that are looking at both the capture and the storage side. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today, though, is uh, regional impacts. And so, like you say, you know, Project Tundra is really trying to determine whether or not it makes economic sense for a plant to move forward with these technologies. Uh, what the regional impact studies are doing are saying, hey, if we did move forward with these, with these uh, types of technologies in the state, uh, what would be the, the positives uh, that would come out of that in terms of job creation, in terms of increased tax revenue to the state? And so that's really the message, I think, that we want to drive home uh, with the studies that we're going to be talking about today. So just to, uh, I guess, state the question very plainly was, um, you know, if we're looking at the largest coal-fired power plants in North Dakota, the ones where we think it makes technical sense to do uh, carbon capture, um, and we did a 90% carbon capture at these facilities, uh, what would be um, the economic impact to the state for both doing the carbon capture, but then also uh, picking target oil fields for doing enhanced oil recovery? Um, and CO2 recovery, and so uh, we're looking at uh, this from both sides of the spectrum, both the, uh, the utility and the carbon capture side and the oil field side, and so really what we're trying to do here is uh, uh, link the two industries together. And so I think I, I mentioned this before, but you know, what this study intends to do again is really try to, try to provide that economic picture of what that impact might be. Uh, keeping in mind that this is a scenario uh, that we're looking at uh, as a potential future scenario. So we're, we're trying to uh, kind of guess uh, at what things might look like, but it's simply just one scenario. And how things are going to play out in reality, uh, you know, certainly would be on a utility by utility basis making those types of decisions. Um, so we are developing high level cost estimates to, to go along with this scenario. Um, and we're doing, uh, we're using economic impact models then. Uh, to take the results of those uh, economic analyses to understand then what might job creation be as a result of that economic activity and uh, what might be the revenue to the state. Um, and it should be understood too that these estimates really are, you know, order of magnitude level type of estimates to where, you know, we're not going to get up here and say it's, you know, going to be exactly, you know, 803 jobs or something like that. These, these are estimates that we're trying to make to kind of give everybody a sense of the, the potential impact that these things might have. Um, so again, outside the scope is really, we're not trying to make an economic decision for an individual plant at this point. Uh, we've got projects like Project Tundra that are super focused on trying to do that kind of work and understand if it would be economical to do carbon capture, you know, for that specific situation. Um, so going forward then, looking at, you know, the inputs for this study and really what we're focused on. So we've got the in existing infrastructure um, on the left side of the slide there. We've got the mines and the power plants. And then on the right side there, we show the existing infrastructure with our conventional oil fields. Um, and for this study, what we're looking at then is the new construction that would take place um, as a result of, of uh, the, the link, I guess, that we're going to put with these industries. And so we've got uh, carbon capture facilities uh, that we would need to construct in order to make this happen. We've got CO2 pipelines, uh, CO2 compression and recycle facilities, um, as well as uh, CO2 injection wells. So basically all the stuff that you would have to do in the oil field um, in order to be able to use this carbon uh, for this enhanced oil recovery process. And so uh, by doing this and by putting this infrastructure in place, we truly are linking then the coal industry uh, to the oil industry in North Dakota, which we think is a, is a great positive for, for the state. Uh, one of the things we talk about is why capture 90%. Uh, of course, that, that's a question. Uh, 
partly why we're looking at 90% uh, capture is, you know, that's the type of scenario that we thought it was prudent to evaluate. Um, Section 45Q incentives would certainly um, make the economic case such that if you're going to do carbon capture and you're, and you're going to uh, spend the capital to do carbon capture, um, we've got tax incentives, we've got, um, you know, things that, that give you a reason to maximize then that production. So um, you're almost looking at it like you're producing CO2 as your product and you want to maximize that production. So uh, that's one of the reasons we focused on 90% there. Uh, we also looking at minimizing the overall capture cost in terms of a dollar per ton basis. Um, and so studies that we've done at EERC really have shown that um, if we look at, you know, the cost of carbon capture in dollars per ton, and I should note that this is with uh, uh, just uh, older conventional technologies, not some of the advanced technologies that are out there today. But even with conventional technologies, you can see that if you're in that 85 to 95 percent capture range, you're really optimizing, uh, you know, the cost of CO2 capture in terms of dollars per ton, and then that cost starts to go up significantly if you're actually looking at capturing less carbon. So uh, we can see a, a very good economic reason why uh, we think we'd want to do 90% uh, carbon capture, and actually, um, you know, since we've made that decision, uh, looking at project Project Carbon specifically within Project Tundra, they're looking at capturing 95% of the of the uh, carbon uh, with their study. So uh, we think it's definitely prudent to be looking at maximizing capture rates. Just to kind of help visualize, I guess, the overall scope of the study. So. Uh, with this study, what we're looking at is taking the five largest uh, coal-fired uh, power plants um, in North Dakota, uh, which ends up being a total of nine individual units or nine individual boilers, and implementing 90% carbon capture um, at those five largest units. And then on the EOR side, what we're looking at is uh, let's pick some target oil fields that we think are potential for uh, near-term opportunities uh, for doing enhanced oil recovery. Um, now, we could certainly debate on uh, exactly which fields would be the best ones to start, but for the purposes of this study, uh, we picked a few that we thought had some good potential. Um, certainly, again, I uh, can't stress enough that uh, these types of studies would really be up to the individual plant and the individual utility and the, the oil companies to decide, you know, where they're going to target and, and what things they're going to go after. Uh, worth noting, though, that the circled areas uh, what we're estimating then is about 270 million barrels um, of potential additional oil recovery um, as a result of injecting CO2 into those areas. So you can imagine that additional oil recovery uh, could be a pretty significant uh, revenue or tax impact to the state as well um, in a very positive way. For this study, we are targeting the conventional oil fields. Um, and we think that's because the, the conventional definitely represents the near-term opportunity. Um, the Bakken, of course, is out there as well, and, and we see that as the future, and we're doing studies every day um, at EERC to try to unlock that potential and see if we can utilize CO2. Uh, when we look at the conventional oil fields, we are a little bit uh, CO2 uh, limited in terms of how much oil or how much CO2 uh, those fields can take. And so, uh, our total CO2 production from those five plants with 90% capture, we're estimating about 26 million tons uh, per year of CO2. Uh, and we're only talking about an oil field demand of about 5 million tons a year. So there's definitely, uh, there's definitely some room for growth. Uh, you know, once we've got this CO2 in hand, there's additional places we could put it. Um, so if we're not putting an oil field, the study is assuming that we're doing geologic uh, sequestration into some of the formations in North Dakota that are certainly uh, suitable for that type of uh, sequestration type project. Um, if we did expand, though, uh, our scope of study, so those circled areas I showed on the previous map, if we expanded those circles, uh, we do see the full potential for oil field demand in North Dakota to be about 13 million tons per year. This is again with the conventional fields only, uh, which would represent about a billion barrels of additional oil recovery. And so we think that's the long-term target. That's what we want to go for for the conventional. Uh, we start getting into the Bakken and Three Forks, and then the, the sky is really the limit. Uh, the, we couldn't produce enough CO2 um, over short periods of time to be able to, uh, uh, you know, satisfy the demand that that Bakken oil field might have. Uh, we've got some estimates there, you know, 4 billion to 7 billion barrels. Uh, a lot of people think those estimates are actually a little bit lower right now. So uh, we, don't, we don't see a, any kind of limitation uh, if we can put CO2 into the Bakken. 
One of the things that we're doing with this study is economic impact analysis. Um, and so with uh, uh, economic impacts, this is something that you know, was a little bit new to me as I started down the pathway of going into this study. And that's why we uh, uh, also brought on Dean Bangson from uh, NDSU, who does a lot of great studies for the lignite industry in understanding what the uh, job impact is of the lignite industry on the state of North Dakota. Uh, but when we do look at this analysis, we talk about effects um, in terms of job creation. And so if you started a new project in, the North, in North Dakota, uh, the direct effects are those effects where uh, we've got employees directly working on that project. So you know, in this example, we're talking about a construction worker that would be pouring foundations um, you know, for the carbon capture unit. Um, indirect effects, though, are jobs created at all these support companies that support, all, uh, support these industries, but more specifically for this study, that support the uh, economic activity that we're talking about, which is you know, construction of a, of a capture plant. And so an example of that might be a welder um, you know, at a local machine shop that's producing components that are, that are being utilized in this capture plant. Uh, but then there's also induced effects, and so that's jobs created at businesses uh, that support the local workforce. So you've got, obviously got housing, you've got food, entertainment, all those sorts of things. Um, so if you add up all those effects then that uh, an economic activity might have, uh, you get the total effect when you add up those three, uh, those three categories. And so when you think about economic impact analysis then from the standpoint of you know, this industry, the coal industry, then what we're talking about is you know, the direct effects again are of course you know, these construction workers, uh, oil field workers, drilling, uh, that sort of thing. Um, the indirect effects, and those can really also be thought of as you know, goods and services that are purchased by the companies uh, that are doing this work that need that additional support from the, from the surrounding community and the surrounding vendors and that sort of thing. And then of course the induced effects again, you know, food, shelter, transportation, um, apparel, all those kinds of things that uh, all of the employees need in order to, in order to uh, get by as well. So we, we take all that um, and, and we can start looking at some of the studies that uh, Dean um, and his team at NDSU have put together today. And so uh, this is actually uh, information from a study that was just released here uh, by Dean within the last uh, couple of weeks, actually. Um, and so what we're looking at is this is just the lignite industry today. So this isn't considering the scenario we've been talking about in our project. Uh, but you can see that there is a high level of business activity, uh, you know, about 3,800 direct jobs and about uh, 10,000 uh, secondary jobs, uh, which we're, we're adding up that indirect and induced jobs together. And so um, in total, then, you're looking at about 14,000 jobs that the lignite industry currently provides to the state. Um, and so I think what we want to talk about now is, well, if we added this carbon capture and storage, what would be the addi additional jobs uh, that would be created? Uh, question becomes a little bit, and I'll try not to belabor these points too much, but the question becomes, you know, how do we actually do those types of estimations uh, for the state uh, for a project that's really, um, you know, is something that we're conceiving or something that's notional? Um, and so what we used and what actually, you know, Dean Banks on at NDSU uh, used was an economic, uh, an impact analysis for planning model uh, that's referred to as implan, and it's actually a pretty widely model used um, in the economics industries uh, where we can talk about uh, taking some of these uh, capital expenditures and that sort of thing that we're estimating, us, us engineers are estimating for you know, building a capture system and taking those estimates and then turning that back around into an economic impact analysis that actually goes through, estimates jobs, estimates the potential tax revenue for the state. Um, and so we've got uh, a model then um, that uh, you know, basically allows for customization and allows for us to really make sure it's tailored to the uh, state of North Dakota. Uh, a lot of words here, I did some of the information here from Dean. I won't talk about all of this in detail, but uh, basically the message to take away here is that we did have to take the model um, as it's contained out of the box and customize it for the state of North Dakota. Uh, one example would be is that the model assumes that we're exporting 50% of our, our coal here in the state that we mine, which of course is simply, as you all know, not, not true. And so uh, Dean went through um, and adjusted and rebuilt uh, some of these different sectors in the model to make sure it accu accurately represents the, uh, the way that the economy truly works works in the state of North Dakota, um, and the studies that he puts out every two years uh, really what enable him to be able to do that. Um, 
accurately uh, through the survey data and those sort of things that he does. Um, so he does, uh, you know, they do surveys out at NDSU where they're calling around asking about jobs, that sort of thing. And so that data that you all provide to him um, is also going directly into this study. So not only does it feed, uh, you know, some of the studies that he's been releasing, it's also helping us to understand these economic impact analyses as well. Um, so certainly thank you everybody for, you know, providing that types of information to Dean uh, so that we can carry these studies forward. Um, so again, I won't go over all of these different uh, details here, but uh, certainly come talk to me later if, if you're interested or, or talk to Dean, he can give you much better answers than I can. Some of the key scenario assumptions that we've talked about, 90% carbon capture then from the five largest plants um, in North Dakota. We are only looking at the conventional oil fields at this point. Uh, the Bakken is out there and, and we think it's our future uh, for enhanced oil recovery, but uh, uh, we're gonna start with conventional while we, while we build up this infrastructure in the state. Uh, we are storing anything we produce uh, beyond oil field demand geologically in some of the formations. Um, and for this part of the scenario, we did look at a $60 uh, per barrel oil price. So we're looking at a, a relatively conservative uh, oil price there as well. Um, and then there's some additional uh, capture plant assumptions there, including uh, the use of auxiliary boilers and basically just some basic solvents as opposed to some of the advanced solvents that are really being researched in Project, uh, Project Tundra today. Uh, for pipelines, we are looking at uh, trunk line development, uh, meaning that uh, some of these plants can share pipelines and, and helping to get the uh, CO2 out to the oil fields. Uh, we think that's important and, and something that the state might want to even consider supporting in the future um, in order to ensure that, uh, you know, enhance, I guess, the economic potential for these types of projects. Um, and then we do have some uh, oil field assumptions as well in terms of uh, the additional wells that we're going to have to drill in order to be able to inject the CO2 and, and make sure that we can store it down there as well. There are a lot of incentives out there uh, from both the federal government and the state government for doing uh, CO2-based EUR. Um, and so the 45Q, uh, I know Senator uh, Heidkamp did touch on this um, as well, uh, but the 45Q does give a, a company the ability to recover uh, $35 per ton um, in tax credits. Um, there's certainly, there's currently some talk that's out there about, you know, are these, are these credits transferable? Are there ways that these utilities could monetize these tax credits um, in a better manner? So that, those kinds of discussions are ongoing, and I think Senator Heidkamp alluded to that in her talk as well. Um, what I didn't list on here, and I really should have, was uh, you also get the potential for a $50 per ton credit if you just uh, store the CO2 geologically. So in a, in a deep uh, saline formation, for example, uh, if you store the CO2 there, you'll get a $50 per ton uh, tax credit, so actually um, even higher. Uh, the other incentives that I have listed on the, the bottom of the slide that are more the state-based incentives uh, for doing EOR, but there's uh, coal conversion tax incentives, uh, a lot of sales tax incentives. Uh, one of the big uh, ones I want to point out is the 0% extraction tax uh, for 10 years uh, for this uh, tertiary incremental recovery. Um, so if you are doing tertiary recovery, um, you do actually have a 0% uh, extraction tax for 10 years. The production tax still applies, but again, it does uh, uh, give these oil companies some additional incentive to uh, want to go forward and drive uh, CO2 capture um, in the state of North Dakota. Going to list, uh, you know, we've got the nine units here then that we evaluated and we've, uh, you know, basically here just showing that we did some calculations uh, using a model that's provided by the U.S. Department of Energy called the Integrated Environmental Control Model. Uh, this model allows you to do uh, not only cost estimates but also emission estimates uh, from various coal-fired power plants. So again, uh, you know, we're, we're using some of the existing models that are out there today to uh, estimate the emissions and estimate the costs of these capture systems. Again, uh, a project like Project Tundra is really what needs to go forward to, to understand really what that true cost is gonna be uh, for very specific units. But we had to get some numbers uh, in order to uh, you know, help support the study, and so we felt that this model uh, is very reputable. Uh, the DOE definitely encourages use of it, and uh, we used it then to, uh, to help us estimate not only the uh, emissions uh, that you see there, but also the costs. Um, and so when it comes to adding post-combustion carbon capture to an existing unit, you, you do have a couple of decisions uh, that you actually could make in terms of how do I want to set this thing up. Um, and so you can see I've listed an example unit I'm calling Unit X right now, you know, that has a 417 uh, megawatt uh, you know, net electric output. 
Um, if we put capture on and utilize the steam within the plant to do that capture, uh, we would actually uh, plan to see a reduction then in the plant output down to around 277 megawatts. Again, these are estimates. Uh, and with a certain level of capex there in terms of dollars per kilowatt. Uh, for this study, though, what we looked at was uh, we're going to provide the steam that's necessary for the CO2 capture unit to operate. Uh, we're going to provide that steam with an auxiliary boiler, so we're not quite hitting the plant with such a big D-rate, I guess, in that situation. Uh, you know, it should be noted, though, like for Project Tundra, for example, we are actually just looking at a direct uh, steam cycle integration. So um, there are definitely different options, and uh, these utilities are going to have to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis to see what makes the most sense uh, for them and for their situation. Um, there are also si situations out there where you could add an auxiliary boiler that's going to produce both steam and electricity, um, in which case you're not doing a, a D-rate at all. Um, in this case, we are showing a higher uh, net electrical output simply due to uh, the boiler sizes that the model felt were available um, at the time. Uh, but again, for this study, we are, we are assuming that we have an auxiliary boiler that's producing steam for the capture unit. As far as the capture plant construction goes, we assume that we have a maximum of two capture plants that could be built uh, simultaneously in North Dakota. Uh, we figure we have to have uh, some economic limits on there in terms of what's out there for the workforce. Um, additional construction activities for other plants then commenced in, in basically a stage manner, and I'll kind of try to illustrate that in one slide here for you. Um, and we're looking at both pipelines um, and the oil field infrastructure to be uh, implemented basically in a similar manner. Um, and so that, that's kind of the, how we're looking at this construction. And maybe let me illustrate that for you. So if we're looking at you know, nine capture plants on the left there for, for nine different units, uh, we're looking at being able to do that over a 12-year period, where by year 13, uh, we've, actually got, uh, we've actually got all plants operating. And so, um, in years uh, one through three then, we're starting construction on the first unit and then uh, making operations happen on that unit as well. Um, and we're also simultaneously doing construction of the CO2 capture on the second unit and then making operations uh, happen on that unit. Uh, we made the assumption that for then the third unit, uh, we're able to start uh, you know, pouring foundations, concrete, that sort of thing, uh, after the uh, foundations and such have been poured on the uh, first two units and then able to, uh, to move that one forward as well. Um, and so then we kind of just proceed in this staged manner here uh, for how we could implement these, uh, these carbon capture plants. And again, this is just a, a scenario assumption that you know, enables us to do an economic evaluation, how, how these plants would actually implement carbon capture uh, throughout the state of North Dakota really is dependent on you know, their individual economic situations um, as well as potential regulatory drivers, that sort of thing that could be out there. Um, so then you can see, you get to the end of this slide here, by year then 12, we've got all the plants built, and then by year 13, we've got CO2 being produced at all these plants and, and operations um, have been commenced. Uh, we assumed a similar type of a build-out scenario then for the oil fields, but I won't go into um, all the details on that one as well. So here's some of the results then that we see uh, for the scenario that, that we've just been talking about. Um, and so we've got the uh, basically green colored bars there on the graph. Uh, the bottom axis there is, is years. So looking through an 18 year period is, is how far we went with this study. Um, and looking at on the left hand um, is the annual tax and revenue to the state. Um, and so that's the, the bars on there are corresponding to that left hand. And so you can see that there is an increase in annual tax and revenue to the state. Uh, years uh, you know, 1 through 12, you see a big increase. A lot of that is due to just the construction activities that are going on and some of the income taxes and such that are being uh, generated. But also, you know, starting in years 4 and 5, we are starting to see some of that um, additional uh, tax revenue coming in from the EOR act, uh, excuse me, activities that are going forward in the state as well. So that continues to build up into year 12 and then by year uh, 14 through 18 uh, we're starting to, to reach a number of around 140 to 160 million dollars um, in annual tax revenue to the state that we see just as a result of those EOR activities plus some of the employees that are still on board uh, continuing to operate these carbon capture facilities. Um, on the right hand bar and corresponding with the blue line on the chart is just the total annual economic activity. So it's another economic measure that's generated, uh, trying to understand what that activity might be. Uh, but you can see we see on the order long term of up to 2.5 billion um, in total economic activity just as a result um, of this scenario. Total job creation then for this scenario, or scenario one I guess as we're calling it, 
um, you can see the direct uh, jobs in the darker color and then in the lighter green color you can see the uh, indirect plus induced jobs and so you can see a lot of jobs are created uh, throughout the construction phase uh, peaking at about 14,000 jobs in this scenario under year seven um, and then as we get out to years uh, 13 through 18 uh, those jobs become stable then as that operation um, has fully commenced but then we're also seeing about 8,000 then uh, long-term annual jobs uh, that are being created just as a result of this scenario. So overall then, uh, just to kind of summarize those numbers then, you know, in this, uh, in this study then, we're seeing 2.5 billion total economic activity, probably greater than 140 million um, in annual tax revenue, um, and at least uh, 8,000 uh, annual jobs that we see being created just as a result of doing carbon capture and enhanced oil recovery uh, with these limited number of fields uh, that we talked about. One of the things that we want to look at is actually unlocking then the full potential of conventional EOR in the state of North Dakota. Uh, like I said, we had started with this assumption that we're going to just look at some of these near-term target oil fields. Well, we think it's prudent, I mean, we, we were discussing this, and to expand, I guess, the scope of the study out to um, you know, what we think as the full potential for conventional oil fields in the state of North Dakota. Um, so working with some of my colleagues, we've identified then actually 201 conventional oil fields. Um, so basically all the conventional, the darker blue ones uh, that are shown on this slide are the, the oil fields that we're looking at. Uh, these conventional oil fields would require significant amounts of CO2 in order to realize their enhanced oil, oil recovery potential. And by doing that, we think we can produce up to 1 billion barrels um, of incremental oil. And so again, that's basically taking the CO2 that we've already captured in the scenario I just presented, and now continuing to expand that out to additional oil fields in the state, continuing to develop those oil fields in the state. Um, so if we did that, and we look at the uh, full potential for EUR in North Dakota then, uh, we're looking at, in this study then, um, up to again, 1 billion barrels of additional oil, uh, but if we assume now, looking out into the future, we're going to go with $65 a barrel uh, as far as the, the oil recovery price, uh, we're actually looking at the potential for $300 million a year in additional uh, revenue to the state. And that's you know, primarily, again, through these oil extraction taxes um, that are out there. So we see that as being a pretty big number um, in terms of the full potential. Uh, that would mean uh, through these studies and estimates then over 30 year time, for, over 30 year time frame, uh, we're actually looking at uh, 45 billion in total economic impact to the state um, as a result of this CO2 EUR and upwards of 15,000 long term jobs per year. So this is year after year jobs that we would have in the state just from doing this CO2 EUR. All right, so wrapping it up, I guess, what does it all mean? I think, uh, you know, from a high level, long-term perspective, which is what this, this study is trying to accomplish, uh, we definitely see a positive outlook for uh, CO2 EUR um, in North Dakota. We see technology advancement uh, as being something that's key, uh, you know, to unlocking all of this. We see the, the work that we're doing in Project Tundra is going to be instrumental in, in ensuring that the economics are there to motivate uh, different plants and utilities and, and oil companies to uh, go forward and want to do CO2 EOR in the state. Um, certainly if we can resolve some of these uncertainties, we know our senators are working hard on that in these 45Q tax credits. Uh, we think that that can go a long ways as well um, in encouraging um, all of you to, to do this type of work. Um, and, but I think you know, the benefits obviously are clear, I think, if, if we do deploy these, uh, de deploy these technologies. So. In conclusion, I guess, the lignite industry uh, certainly has a, a significant economic impact to the state of North Dakota. Uh, that's an industry that we're all interested in, in seeing have a very long and healthy future. Uh, we see carbon capture as being able to link those two industries together, the, the coal industry and the oil industry, and, and really being able to unlock, I guess, uh, a new opportunity for the state. Uh, we are working on additional comprehensive assessments uh, for this project, and we do expect to have uh, some of the final numbers from these comprehensive assessments available here uh, by the end of the calendar year. So with that, I've got a couple of uh, disclaimers. Certainly uh, thank the DOE uh, for their participation in this project, and don't want to pass over uh, NDIC and the Lignite Energy Council for also being very supportive um, of this work as well. Um, so with that, I guess, uh, if there's any time for questions, I'd be happy to, to take some.
We have about uh, about two minutes, so maybe time for one one question. We uh, are kind of coming up against a hard break here. A couple of years ago, I had the privilege of working in Estevan, Saskatchewan, at a SAS Power carbon capture sequestration project. And I think that's complete. Uh, what do you know about that? What can you learn from that? And is there things to learn from their technology, their financial model? Do you know are they profitable now? And yeah, and add some of those. No, thank, thank you for that. There's, there's certainly a lot of lessons uh, that can be learned from the SAS Power Project. I mean, we should mention when we're talking about carbon capture, um, you know, this is a fairly new technology. Uh, SAS Power was kind of first to do it on a commercial scale. They built about a 100 megawatt unit. Uh, we now have the Petronova unit that's operating down in Texas. That's about a 240 megawatt unit. Uh, if we go forward in the state of North Dakota, we're looking at a 470 megawatt unit. So we're going through that technology progression. But to answer your question, uh, yeah, we've actually uh, had some individuals. Uh, John Kay, for example, who's in the audience, uh, was just uh, visiting their facility a few weeks ago along with Mike Holmes. And really, uh, they want to share that knowledge. They want to share those lessons learned because the first of a kind of a technology is always going to be more expensive than, you know, the end of a kind and so with the, the research and the studies that we're doing we're really working hard to get to that nth of a kind uh, we're working with MHI now um, and their technology which they've uh, they've put in at Petronova we're working on that technology for Project Tundra um, and we think that the lessons learned uh, from MHI I think are going to go a long ways uh, with their existing projects um, in order to lower the cost then and lower the cost significantly uh, for these next projects going forward so absolutely I think we're uh, running out of time here, Josh, so thank you very much for thank your you. presentation. Uh, we, a uh, couple of housekeeping notes here. Give applause for Mr. Josh. The reason why we are anxious to uh, conclude here at this moment is to give caterers enough time to prepare all of our tables here. Um, this is where lunch is going to be served in approximately 15 minutes. And just a note for you before uh, I let you go for a moment, sit at a table that has silverware, otherwise you will not be served. So some tables will not have silverware. And again, lunch is in here. And one more note that I've got here is, uh, if you can, try to network some and sit with different people than where you have been uh, this morning so far. And if you don't know somebody, um, get to uh, know someone else. So thank you very much. Awards luncheon will be here at 12.15.